Welcome, comrades. Uh, welcome to People's Forum. <laughs> Today is a very special day um, because we have a special visit from two comrades who came from very far away, um, from Naples, Italy, from Potra del Popolo. Um, Today we're going to be talking about what's happening in Italy. Uh, New York City is a city with a rich history of migration from Italy. We have Italian flags all over the city, Italian restaurants all over the city. But we know very little about really what's happening in the country. Um, a country which for some activists is occupied by the U.S. military. Italy has over 100 NATO bases on its soil. Um, it's a country that has been very, very impacted by U.S. policies. So it's imperative for us in the United States to understand uh, the social, economic, political composition of the country, especially, especially now as it is undergoing a political crisis, which has been deepened, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, by the war in Ukraine. We're seeing a lot of different uh, movements that are emerging, that are collapsing, the five-star movement, populism. There's a lot of different movements going around in the country. And so we're extremely lucky today to be joined by Mauricio Coppola and Salvatore Princi, who are going to speak about the different elements of the conjuncture. Currently in Italy, they're going to talk about the social, economic, political moment. And they're going to talk about how the movements, how the people on the street in the occupations, in the different territories across Italy, which is not only one Italy, but many different Italies, many different realities, how they're responding, how they're organizing, and how they're making different proposals uh, to emerge from this crisis stronger and more united. So uh, we're going to start from hearing from Mauricio, who's going to give us a little introduction about the current situation in Italy today. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, above all, and for being here with you. It's really great for us to uh, participate in such a moment to present uh, what we are doing there, over there, uh, and uh, how this country that is like, uh, yeah, everyone is watching to the country because it's like one of the most uh, instable countries uh, in Europe, we can think, but we will also show that there are like elements of... Uh, long stability that uh, are dominating the country. So it's really great for us to be here and to uh, talk to you and having like a discussion about, about the current situation in Italy. So I will really start with, uh, with a very general uh, overview of, uh, of the political and socio-economic uh, situation in Italy. Um, because I think that it is always important to have like such, a, an, such an approach to understand what is going on today politically in the current situation. We need to have a little uh, background on history, we need to have a little background on social structure. So this is like in the next 15-20 minutes I will try to give uh, these elements. So when we speak about Italy, I think after uh, World War II, uh, we speak about a country that was uh, uh, really uh, dominated but strong by strong contradictions, social contradictions, political contradictions, economic contradictions. And one of the most uh, impressive uh, contradictions uh, uh, um, war, uh, was above all like the, the fact that Italy was like a, a border between uh, the uh, East and the West. So like the communist East and the capitalist West. And um, this kind of, uh, of of role that Italy had during um, uh, after w World War II uh, till to, uh, to 1992 was above all like uh, transmitted with the dominance and the presence of the Christian Democrats uh, in the government. This is like one of the element of stability of Italy in the, uh, in the 40 years after World War II till the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, the Christian Democrats governed for 40 years. So there was no instability politically. Of course, like every year, every two years, every three years, like the, the government changed, etc. But it was always the Christian Democrats dominating the political institutions. And, um, and the Christian Democrats, they had like a large support from the US, of course, a lot of money 
came from the US to, to Italy, to the Christian Democrats. Uh, of course, it was the period of building of this uh, NATO and US military bases, uh, military bases that still today are used uh, in the wars. For example, Sigonella, it's uh, in, in Sicily on the southern island of Italy. It's still used as a military base for drones going to Eastern Europe to control the territory and to give information uh, for uh, the, the, the Ukrainian military and the, the, the NATO. So there is like this strong uh, connection between the Christian Democrats, the US, US imperialism and NATO. Uh, but there was also like a strong communist movement and communist uh, party during the, the after the uh, World War II period. So you, we have the Communist Party of Italy that was very involved in the uh, uh, resistance of the partisans, the partisan resistance against the fascists. Uh, thanks to the partisans, of course, uh, Italy was also uh, liberated from fascism. And the party grew uh, very uh, rapidly, very fast, uh, reaching uh, in the 70s over 30% of the uh, general consensus. But they never governed, this is uh, important, I underline this, this point, they never governed on a national level, of course, on the regional level and the local level they had, uh, responsibilities. They governed uh, above all regions uh, which uh, were and still are uh, very left, like uh, Tuscany or Emilia-Romagna and so on. But um, on the central level, like the central state was never governed by the Communist Party of Italy. Then we had also a very strong extra-parliamentary movement. This is also something we have to underline. A movement that really pushed forward social struggles in the cities, social struggles in the factories, they were like the uh, vanguard of, uh, of, uh, of the communist movement. And they also put pressure, of course, of, on the communist party. And so like this, this, um, the existence of this strong extra-parliamentary um, movement, revolutionary movement, brought also to what we call the historical, historical compromise between the communist party of Italy and the Christian Democrats in the 70s. And, uh, and this was like the beginning also combined with the economic crisis that uh, uh, all over the world was, uh, was uh, coming, like in the mid-70s. It was also like the start of a decline of the communist movement uh, till uh, the fall uh, of the Berlin Wall. And there, I think we can say that Italy lived the biggest changes uh, for a Western country after the uh, fall of Berlin Wall. Of course, Germany had the huge impact, but like the countries outside of of um, of, um, of of Germany and the Eastern uh, Eastern Europe, Italy li had the biggest changes. Imagine then that today uh, um, the, the 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 landscape of the parties is totally different than 1992. Today, no party. Uh, is existing that existed in 1992 in Italy. I think this is not thinkable in France or in Germany, where we still have like the Socialist Party of France, the Communist Party of, of France, or the Social Democratic Party of Germany and so on, the CDU in, in Germany. Still parties that existed before are still existing today. In Italy, this is not the case. So like the institutional change was really, really, really strong. And uh, today we have uh, a very strong right and far right with the existence also of neo-fascist uh, groups that always existed, of course, and they were integrated also in the social, the social democratic and the Christian Democratic Party after World War II. But they were like uh, rehabilitated and reintegrated above all in 1994 with the uh, coming of Berlusconi and so on and so on. And we have today uh, uh, so a strong right and far right, but uh, a, a center. What is lacking is the left. So the center is like the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party is born was born from the Communist Party of Italy. So after 1992, with the dissolution of the Communist Party of Italy, uh, the transformation reached till the Democratic Party. And this is really, I mean, it's impressive to see how the Communist Party of Italy, the strongest Communist Party uh, in Europe, uh, uh, with the, uh, the the biggest consensus. Uh, um, in, in, in votes and so on, how they transformed to a democratic party that took the name of the democratic party of, of the US, but is, we can say, even more right than the democratic party of, of, uh, of, uh, of the United States. So this is more or less the landscape today. Uh, so there is really a lack of a, of a left. There was the, 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 
the development of like the, the Italian populism with the Five Star Movement. We will talk about that also later. Um, but this is like the historical process I wanted shortly to, uh, to give you some points, some elements, some keywords, just to understand the development. But to understand also why uh, or how we reached the situation, it is also important to have some, uh, some elements of the uh, social and economic structure of Italy. And this is the reason why I'm using PowerPoint, something I really practically never do. But I think it's important to see some graphics and some pictures and so on. So Italy, I mean, it's like, it's like the most countries, uh, capitalist countries in Europe and in the world. This is like the development of the GDP. I will not make a, a lesson of economy. Do not fear about that. I'm not an economist. It's just to give some elements. So we see that at the end, Italy uh, had, uh, of course, like a, a GDP that was always growing. But we had also like these three big crises in the last uh, 15 years. It started with 2008 with the subprime crisis. The result there is the first fall of the GDP. Then we had 2011, the sovereign debt crisis that uh, uh, Italy was like confronted with. And of course, 2020, the most impressive uh, decline of, of the GDP, the corona crisis. So uh, this is like the, the development of the GDP uh, in Italy in the last years. But if we have this picture, we can think, okay, Italy is one country. Italy is something that, like, it's a hegemon, a, a, a homogeneous, homogene, homogenic uh, country, but it's, uh, it's not the, the case. We have, like, huge regional differences, and this is very important historically, but also to understand how to move today. So we see here is the GDP per capita distributed in, in the um, European Union, and we see that the Italian South has a GDP a development very similar to the European East and to the uh, European South. If we look to the northern part of Italy, we can see that there is a really high GDP. And this GDP makes is, of course, like determined by the industrial development that uh, the northern Italy has. And uh, we can uh, define and consider the northern part of Italy like the hinterland of Germany, of like the most advanced capitalism in Europe. And this is really true. I mean, the, the biggest exchange, commercial ex exchange, uh, is between uh, Germany and the northern part of Italy. So the Italian, the Italian industry in the north is producing elements that goes to the German uh, factories to, 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 to build and to produce uh, uh, machines and so on. So this is very important. These differences between this, uh, yeah, these inequalities between uh, GDP. Then, uh, of course, like uh, the, the question of the globe of the Italian South and the North, it was a question uh, already treated in the 70s. And in the 70s, a, a newspaper, Corriere della Sera, one of the main uh, national newspapers said, if we go on like this, if the politics, the Italian politics will develop like this, we can like uh, uh, eliminate the uh, inequalities between North and South only in 2020. We are in 2022. What is the situation? Of course, like the unemployment rate in uh, Southern Italy, it's much higher than in Northern Italy. Yeah, this red in the middle there, it's Naples, exactly. <laughs> Unemployment rate that reaches officially 17.6% in the Italian South, but in like some territories like uh, Naples, like uh, some territories of Calabria and so on, we have even 30, 40% of youth unemployment. So there is like a drastic, a huge uh, inequality uh, uh, concerning um, uh, unemployment. It, there is also like the quality of, uh, of work, of labor. We have also to, to see the difference. Like lavori regolari, it's uh, irregular work. What we, in, in Italy, we call it black labor, that, that black work. That means that people with, working without contract uh, and so on. So in the South, the quality of the work is much, uh, uh, it's, it's not so good like, in the, like in, the, in the North. We have like also the, Occupation, female occupation, that is really, a, there is a huge gap between uh, the, the north and the south. We have like in no region of the Italian south, we have more than 50% of uh, women uh, working. So we have like in Sicily only a little bit more than 30% of women working. So this is also uh, uh, an element of these inequalities. 
And um, and yes, and a, a last thing concerning like the the Italian South, it's important to see it's the development also demography, the demographic development. We see here like the the, the development that uh, it's going down, like the Italian society, it's degrowing, it's not growing. It's like one of the uh, the the. The, the only country in, in Europe that this has like such a development, a development that cannot be uh, uh, balanced with uh, immigration, like with the people coming, because uh, there is a huge emigration of Italian people uh, away from Italy. And this is touching above all uh, the southern part of Italy, of course. We have more or less 60,000 young people between 18 and 34 leaving Italy every, the southern part of Italy every year. That means that every 10 years we have a city like Palermo, it's the fifth city of Italy, leaving uh, the, the Italy. And this is something very impressive. We have the even higher numbers of emigration of Italian workers, students, uh, than in the 60s when the huge migration uh, uh, movement uh, uh, existed uh, uh, in Italy. So um, let's go also to some socio economic uh, elements. Uh, we uh, generally think that uh, if we see these pictures that Italy can be like, it's considered like uh, the, a country, a rich country, because it's like in the, in, the, in the global north, because it's like it's a western country and so on. Or if you see the other pictures, Italy is a poor country. But I think what describes the best Italy is that's a country you, uh, full of contradictions. We have like the rate of savings in Italy, it's more or less the same as in Belgium. And it's much higher than in Spain, than in Greece, even than in France and Germany. So Italian people, they save money. They have, they, in the history of, the, of, of Italy, of the Italian working class, the Italian working class was always like a, a working class uh, which saved money. So they have like an economic base also to survive uh, economic crisis. And I think this is exactly the reason why in 2011, for example, the Italian working class was not like thrown in a hole and uh, getting really poor because there were savings for the, from the family. There is like a very familiaristic welfare state. And this is the reason why like the social structures can more or less be uh, saved and they survive. But there is also something different that there is like, like a huge inequality in, uh, in the wealth distribution. We see here the richest 20% of the society earn 70% of the uh, Italian wealth. And on the other side, the 20% of the poorest uh, uh, part of the society earn only 1.3%. So there is a huge um, a part of people who can save uh, money, but at the other side also like a huge uh, inequality on, um, on, uh, uh, on wealth. Then another element that uh, not a lot of people know that's uh, a graphic that shows uh, housing properties. Italy, this is a statistic, I don't know, I, I found different statistics, but at least 73% of the Italian people own their own house. So there is like a huge uh, house property in Italy, also the working class is owning uh, houses. And it is also like an element of uh, how uh, um, like, uh, yeah, poverty can be in a way uh, balanced because like, there is like the heritage for a lot of younger people is the house of the of the working class family, so they have at least some uh, some element of, of welfare and wealth they can they can have. Um, other statistics are showing that the the, the number are growing to, till eighty percent. So a huge number of Italians own in a way a house. And if you see also richer countries like Germany or Switzerland, the the percentage it's much deeper. So this is also uh, an element that shows the contradictions in, in Italy. Then one, uh, two last points. It's um, above all concerning like uh, salaries. Italy is the only country from Europe that in the last 30 years didn't have an increase of real salaries. Um, we have like in the European East, in the Eastern countries, huge increases, of course. This is because of like the integration in the EU, in the EU market, the, in the introduction of the Euro. So there was like a, a big jump. Italy had a decrease of 3% of the salaries. This is also a reason why we as Poteral Popolo are really working a lot on this question of uh, wealth distribution and salaries. We are now leading a campaign for a, uh, a legal minimum wage of at least 10 euro per hour. 
because this is like a big question. Like uh, we call them salari di fame, so like hunger salaries. People cannot afford um, uh, food because of, of uh, low salaries, and this is a, a, a very important element. So this is the socio socioeconomic situation. How was it transformed in the last elections? We will uh, Salvatore will speak about the current situation uh, in 2022. We had in 2018 the last elections. The last elections were dominated by the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement was born like around 2010, let's say. They had like their first uh, meetups in the regions, in the territories. They presented themselves very uh, strongly as like uh, um, a social movement party, uh, contesting like uh, the political caste and uh, corruption in the Italian politics and institutions. Uh, they presented themselves. Uh, being neither right nor left, so they like it was like this post ideology thing uh, that was really uh, very sensitive. It is like a contradiction in Italy, as I explained before. We had like a very important uh, communist movement. The communist party was very strong. We have still like uh, communist culture in a way, songs, uh, art, and so on is very dominated also by leftist traditions. But at the same time, you have a really strong anti-communist feeling uh, in society. So this was like this post-ideology uh, tendency of the Five Star Movement captured exactly this anti-communist uh, feelings. And the third element that was like uh, how the Five Star Movement presented itself, it was like they, they had one programmatic point that was very important, like the extension of social assistance for poor people, the so-called reddito di cittadinanza, that is like, uh, uh, translate, we can translate it as universal income, but it does not the role of this universal income as we know it in the, in the academic and po political debate also in the United States. It's just an expansion of uh, social assistance for uh, welfare for poor people already existing. But they captured the votes, above all in the, in the Italian South. Imagine that in the Five Star Movement in Naples, they reached over 50%, 52% only in the city of Naples, a result that not even the Christian Democrats reached in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s. So it was important. They, they won the elections. But also the far right, the right and the far right won the elections because the coalition of the three forces, political forces, reached 37%. We had like the, uh, the left coalition around the Democratic Party that lost a lot. They, they had over 40% a couple of years before. They, uh, uh, they fall to 23%. Uh, and, um, and another element we have to underline, and then I finish, it's the participation in the vote. I think this is also a tendency we have to take in consideration speaking about the current situation. Uh, Italy had always a very large participation in the elections, 80%, 85%. This uh, participation is decreasing. We had in 2018 a participation of 73%. That was already like very deep. We have in local and regional elections even deeper participations, like uh, 50%, 47%. And uh, this is the big questions. question, what does it mean? I think uh, this above, above all younger generations uh, disillusioned by, by politics and by the institutional parties, they will say, we will not go uh, to vote, we will not participate. So abstentionism, like the people uh, keeping themselves away from the, from the votes, that's like the, the, yeah, that's the social group we have to target in a way. This is like the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest part of the electorate and we have to work on that. And uh, yes, with that, I think I spoke already too long. I give the word to Salvatore, to Zoe first. Well, thank you so much, Maurizio, for sharing. Um, it certainly does clear in the picture a little bit of, of really what's happening in Italy, what is the context there. And of course, in this very complex situation, Potra del Popolo has been growing, has been building. It is the come building on the legacy of other movements uh, that have developed different forms of organization. And so Salvatore is going to tell us a little bit about that, the history, and what is the current work that they're doing now. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for your invitation and also for the warm hospitality of these days. For us, moments like this are really important because, uh, you know, uh, you got the, usually abroad, you got the worst part of Italy. I mean, Berlusconi and all the stories about him uh, or Sopranos. 
<laughs> or Maneskin now. But uh, <laughs> really, in Italy, we got a lot of interesting stuff which, which is moving. And I want to talk a little bit about this uh, because it's still a, a place where to live. I mean, we got a strong sense of community. We got a human um, <clears throat> you know, approach to people. And it's quite it's quite interesting to see how this is also a form of resistance in a country where politics is judged by people like uh, enemy, like very far from them. And so uh, you got this kind of separation between politics and society, which is uh, the point of the situation. But before going there, uh, I want to see just another thing, uh, how much it is important to have moments like this between uh, US comrades and Italian comrades, because, uh, you know, Italy is one of the most principal partners uh, with uh, US. It's one of the pillar of military strategy of US in Europe. It's uh, the previous president, head of government, Draghi, uh, when he took uh, the government uh, two years ago uh, during pandemic in a great social crisis and when oh, all the debate was about uh, economic found from uh, European Union, uh, he felt this need to say uh, four times that we are pro-NATO, we are pro-Atlantic, we are pro-US. Uh, never in Italian history you can have a government without US support. It's like Italy is a kind of colony of United States. So uh, since we are really aware of that situation and since we are socialists, so that means that we not say, saying socialist stuff, that we want to make socialism or at least put some condition to make socialism. You know, it, it's really important to have this kind of cooperation on international level, because imagine if one day we will have a revolution in Italy, and probably some of your schoolmates will uh, lead the tanks from American bases in, in Italy. That would be very sad. So probably if we have some kind of relation like this, maybe your friends will sabotate tanks, Italian tanks. In Italy. <laughs> but anyway, um, I want to talk we were on that situation in 2018 and I want to talk um, what happened in these last years and uh, why <laughs> this uh, crisis in Italy now. Um, you know, we were supposed to going to go to vote in the next April. So why uh, the government resigned? Why Draghi, which is one of the um, head, uh, the most important person of Italian bourgeoisie, it was really um, the point of agreement of every single fractions of Italian bourgeoisie and European bourgeoisie and the relation with the United States, strictly connected with the United States. So why Draghi? He lost the government. And now, and why it was everything so, you know, sudden, uh, suddenly it <laughs> happens. Well, <clears throat> you got to think that uh, we, we got to start by, uh, from five star movements, because um, I will articulate my position in three theses. Uh, first thesis, thesis is that what is happening is um, very unusual and with no, uh, you know, never seen in the history of the country. And this opens risks, but also, well, some opportunity. And yeah, this thesis now, you, it, it's, you know, you can see it in all around the world. I mean, uh, pandemic, climate change, everything we see in these years, it's quite interesting. So maybe risk and opportunities. But in Italy, it's quite strong, this uh, feeling. Because you see, you can take a party that uh, took uh, zero point three or four in the elections, like five star movements, and he grew up like uh, until 33. That was a score that no mm, party did except um, Christian democracy during 50s. 
So that was incredible. Um, and that was a symptom of uh, difficult in society and difficult of dominant classes in Italy to have consensus. But then what happened? Uh, they did not not use uh, this consensus to change situation and to have social reform. They say we are neither uh, for the left, neither for the right. And then first government, they were allied with the far right extreme party in Italy, which is the North League. Then they did the same party, five star movements, did another government with the <laughs> left party, democratic party, that was really the enemy for, for them for the last 10 years. And then, third of all, they were uh, really in this populist rhetoric, we hate bankers, we are against the elite. Third government, uh, owned by Five Star Movements, I mean, they were the majority in the government, was with a banker, Draghi which is uh, the most important banker in Italy. But so uh, you can understand that people, uh, the masses looking at this are very disgusted, you know. Uh, they were disgusted by left because during 20 years uh, the Communist Party became Democratic Party and they did all the social, the worst social reform in Italy. They tried to change the situation voting five star movements and they saw that you know you can vote a party and this party make alliance with all the parties in the in the government and then at the end it ends with your enemy the bankers the elite and so on and then what happened this government it seems to be very stable i mean in parliament they had the 85 percent of votes so it, it was very difficult to find some deputy that was against this government. The only party who made the opposition was Brothers of Italy, which is this uh, former fascist party, that it was, in, in, it was increasing in all the polls. And that's the reason why First Star Movement, quite sudden, after losing, losing, losing consensus in the polls, decided to uh, go out to uh, exit from the government. And Berlusconi, who is yeah, uh, a, a political, uh, is a genius, you know, uh, of course we hate him, but uh, he understood very well that he could not uh, leave uh, Five Star Movements and Brothers of Italy being the opposition. And so he decided in two hours, so nobody expected or, uh, all the things that happened. That, that's quite interesting. We Marxists, you know, we always uh, think about structures. So we always think there is a rationality in history. And yes, it's true. But sometimes, you know, irrationality takes over and it's like a domino. When someone starts, then do, 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 do. like in the First World War, nobody, that, the contradiction was there, but nobody believed truly that it could happen. The day before the government resigned, everybody was saying like he will never resign, but people really in the government and so it was like a domino. Mo uh, five star movements goes out, then Berlusconi goes out, then Nord League goes out, then Draghi, he still had majority, say, I cannot afford the next autumn and winter in Italy if we have not a government of, uh, of national unity. And so the government are resigned. Which is very interesting is that now, uh, the feeling of the people, uh, it's like we are disgusted, it's a, it's a show, uh, we don't want to participate to it, we won't go to vote. Um, in 2018, you had uh, a big participation, 70%, because voting five-star movements, people uh, hoping, uh, hoped that there would be some change. Uh, now, in the last two years, the participation um, in voting, it's about 50%. So it's expected that one Italian uh, on two won't <laughs> go uh, to vote. 
these years. And, uh, and, and what you see is that political party has really uh, distance, are really distance from the rest of society, you know? Uh, and so uh, political party are doing like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, jokes and it's funny because you sign an agreement, I don't know, democratic party with another leader party, and then three hours after, the leader of that little party go to television and say, I'm going to go with the right because I had another agreement. And so people, you know, uh, feel like I don't have to uh, talk about politics, to think about politics. I just want to think about my family, think how to survive after the pandemic. If I get a job and I... Uh, and well, well, I want to think about a mu um, about enjoy, you know, with my friends and have holidays because after pandemic, uh, we have very difficult times. So that's the feeling now what, what, about what is happening in Italy. And that was uh, the first thesis. It's without uh, never look before that uh, the situation could be like this. Nobody expected. And, and so there is uh, one risk. Uh, we have uh, probably um, two most probable scenarios. The first of all, um, the first one is that the Meloni, uh, Meloni, Giorgia Meloni is the leader of Brothers of Italy. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's funny because she's a woman, but she's a leader of a party <laughs> whose name is Brothers of Italy. Uh, but uh, Giorgia Meloni uh, probably will lead uh, they're going to win the election, the coalition of right will win the election, and so will be uh, the first uh, leader, uh, woman leader in Italy. And it's very strange because all the uh, struggles for uh, woman emancipation were made in Italy by uh, the left you know, and the leftist social movements. And uh, that situation could be very dangerous because her party is still a fascist party. I mean, if you talk with some militants, that they, they, they are fascist. But in a way, uh, it won't change a lot because he's, she stays in a coalition. She already been uh, in the government with Berlusconi, so she's not talking extreme. She came here in the United States uh, to find an agreement with uh, U.S. establishment and, and to um, say I'm not fascist so I can go to government in Italy. Se um, the second scenario, it's about uh, Berlusconi uh, will uh, play the game so he goes to election with Giorgia Meloni, but then after the election, since we are a parliamentarian uh, republic, that means that it's the party, the center. You don't vote for the president, you vote the party. So the party can change alliance. And so Berlusconi could say, well, we need a government of national unity, so we'll have, uh, he won't, he doesn't want that Giorgia Meloni would be the next president, so he makes an agreement, makes an agreement with Democratic Party, uh, other center party, and Forza Italia, which is his party. And so uh, the second scenario, it's a big center, of course, conservative, Christian, Democrats, and so on. Uh, but what, there is something that sure will not change, and that's uh, brings us to the second thesis. Um, any government will, uh, we will have after elections will face the worst crisis uh, in the history of Italy. Uh, we got a big inflection now in this moment, 10% uh, on annual basis, so it, it, it's a lot. Uh, we have a big uh, energy um, uh, crisis of energy. Um, it seems we will go to have energy rationa uh, rationating in the next winter because Russia is going to stop the furniture of gas and Italy it's really dependent from the gas. So we are paying our alliance with the United States with uh, uh, um, a strong um, cost of lives in, in Italy. And the third um, question is about uh, um, the conflicts in 
in labor, I mean that now uh, with a little economic growth, uh, you know, um, class struggle is starting again. So uh, we'll have a lot of workers which are, uh, who are mobilized in this moment and they are trying, uh, you know, to demand to ask for a grow of salaries. And that's very difficult for all government to afford of all this question in the same time. So we have a, a good condition for um, create the basis, I mean, for socialism, because nobody believes to the people, who are, to the ruling class. Uh, speaking in Gramscian terms, the ruling class has not the hegemony in this moment. They has not a speech to convince people. They has not a, a consensus. They has not uh, a vision uh, in which people can believe. It just, you know, uh, they rule because people are tired, because the people are depressed, because the people are uh, very depressed about all this situation. Uh, there is a lot of resignation about changing things. But they are not ruling because they, they uh, have capability of direction of the country. So that's a good situation in some way, because now if a party, if a group of people, if communities start to be aware of their possibility, of their strongness, they could change a lot of things. Uh, and that brings me to the last thesis um, about power to the people, about social movements. We don't believe we are the center of the world. So I want to talk about all the left and socialist movements in Italy. Um, the thesis is that the shift of the political field to the, toward the center and the right opened um, for the first time since the fall of Berlin Wall a great possibility for uh, socialism in Italy. Uh, we are not in the condition, of course, of making socialism now and in the next five years, but things can change quite quickly because there is a memory uh, very strong in Italy about socialism and communism, and there is uh, a lot of young people who are, uh, who are starting to participate in politics. After 10 years, they really renounce. The only problem is that a lot of young people as um, emigrates to the north of Italy and above all to the north of Europe. So that's a big issue, but of course we are trying uh, to uh, do something about it. So what is the possibility actually? We are, um, now we have uh, the task to uh, participate to election. It's not obvious because in Italy to participate to election, you have to collect signatures and there's a lot of signatures, 60,000 signatures in two weeks. And you cannot collect them in only one place. You have to be present in all Italy, in all the voting district. So, uh, but we think it's important that all the political parties from the left and social movements and the environmental, well, the movement for um, ecology <laughs> being represented in this election. So we are starting a coalition with all other forces and we are collecting signatures and there's a lot of people who wants to uh, who want to participate and that's a good thing and secondly um, it doesn't matter how much we will take to the next election because of course uh, we have one month if we uh, can collect signature we will have one month to have electoral campaign so um, it will be very difficult to enter in the parliament because you are supposed to do at least three percent uh, at the election on national basis. But what is more interesting is that we want to use this election to show another side of the country that you cannot see in television. The majority which is against the war in Ukraine and against uh, the um, weapon support to um, Ukrainian. Uh, the majority, uh, which is, uh, we really, uh, who really cares about salaries. And we want to show uh, this part of the country will start to self-organize 
to uh, respond uh, to their needs uh, since that the states uh, are not really interested in support them. So we are trying to organize this um, side of our country. And the most interesting is that after the election, the match will be very open because um, the next government will face this crisis and we have sensibility that people will uh, respond to the attack that the government uh, is, is going to uh, take against them. So, uh, that's all for the moment, and thank you for your attention, and sorry for my English, but I tried to... <laughs> thank you so much, Salvatore, Maurizio. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot from hearing these presentations. Um, now we are going to open up for any questions. Uh, I don't know if we, we might have some questions from the chat. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. No. I'll let you know if that's um, the case. <laughs> but if, yeah, um, Derek, uh, it, Kate has mic running, so. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very informative. I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, you, you talked about the strong history of the communists uh, in the left uh, and culture and how that, you know, persists today. Um, but I'm wondering about how that legacy, like, impacts your ability to organize not just social movements, but in particular, like the political party, you know, or in particular, the party, uh, because of, you know, the historic compromise and the extra parliamentary oppositions that you were talking about. Any other questions, Omiya? And then. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have a question just about um, internationalism. So I know that uh, during the first peak of the pandemic in Italy, I know that there was a large brigade of Cuban doctors that came um, in support as uh, solidarity aid. Um, if you could just talk about internationalism in and how that, how you see that as helpful in building this working class movement. Um, as you point out, there's the opportunity is is ripe now. Um, so how do you see that um, being incorporated into movement building? Um, hi there. Thank you for this. Uh, this talk has been very informative. Um, so I was just wondering, you mentioned that uh, a lot of the groups on the left have coalesced to try and compete in this upcoming election together to gather signatures. And I was just wondering um, how left unity is going in Italy um, and how sustainable you think it is in the long term. I'm, I'm from Ireland, where left unity will normally last for about one year before it falls apart. Uh, so I'm just curious to see if that's a common theme across Europe or or, or not. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. That was very informative. Um, I was just wondering why you think there is such a history or w what is the reason for the strength of the far right in Italy? And uh, conversely, why is the left so weak, I guess? I mean, I don't know if you think it's changing now, but what about, is it the history? Is it socioeconomics? Uh, what are the factors? I think maybe if um, Maurizio wants to respond to some, then Salvatore, we can see if there are any other questions. Or whoever wants. You were asking the legacy of the, the Communist Party, and or, because yeah. I think I didn't understand. Yeah, so in your talk, you mentioned there's a there's a there's a strong legacy of the communist left still in culture and and elsewhere. I'm wondering if that legacy also prevents the reemergence of a communist left because of the historic compromise and the red brigades and the extra parliamentary groups, etc. Um, yes, I think like there is like. Uh, also, there like a contradiction in the sense that for uh, 
for the youth movement, for example, at university when you organize and so on, I think there is like the, 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 the moment of identity also with like the strength of the Italian uh, communist movement is always very important. You have something you can orientate yourself historically also. So I think for the politicization of uh, a lot of young people, this is an important, movement, uh, important moment. So the legacy is like an, 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 a positive one. But there is also like a negative element, I think, and it's linked above all to like, uh, it's also a question of generation, but it's also a question of identity in a very um, strict sense. If we think that today in 2022, we can just copy paste what happened or copy paste like the, the symbols and the messages and the slogans, it is something that brings you like in a, in a I don't know, that, that way, in a dead end. And this is often happening. I think uh, Salvatore will, will say something about that also with the coalitions like on the, on the institutional level, electoral level. It is a problem today if you say, uh, you have to be a, a communist party with hammer and sickle. If you do not have this symbol in your flag, you're out, you are not a real communist. Or if you say, like, I don't know, uh, civil rights are like secondary. We have only to fight for social rights, workers' rights, because if we solve the primary uh, conflict contradiction between capital and labor, all the other things will come. Uh, rights of homosexuals, women's rights, and so on. And there is still like a strong feeling or positions like this in the communist movement in Italy. A communist movement that is really little, I do not want to say that it's like, it's very marginal, but it still exists. And this is something that, uh, yeah, in a way we, we, we have this, uh, this discussion. So uh, this is one element. Then I think, of course, like the historical compromise of uh, uh, in the 70s, it is something that, a lot of people also now during the, the, the pre-campaign we, we did, like uh, we made like a, a, a round through Italy uh, with, the, with the topic against war and for social justice. So like uh, building the peace movement with, with the, the candidate of, of, uh, of our coalition. And uh, when I was traveling with him this two, three times, I had confrontations with older uh, communists who defend, still defend, like the historical compromise, who still defend also the way that Italy linked to the United States, that we need like this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, I don't know, this, this connection to, to, to a, a bigger thing that can in a way protect us against what is coming from abroad and so on. So like, this may be a contradiction, but it produces also like anti-communist feelings. So this is yeah, more or less uh, what I can say about this. Um, then the question of internationalism. Um, also there, I think in the international topics were always fundamental for uh, like the politicization of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of our generation above all. Uh, I think the solidarity campaigns we did with uh, the Palestinian uh, people, uh, the Cuban revolution as a, a point of orientation of uh, what socialism can real, really be. Uh, that's something fundamental for, for, the, for the generation we lived. And for the younger generation now, I think these topics are in a way very uh, far away because the, the way of uh, getting in touch with politics are totally different as it is not directly also ideologically how it could be with, uh, with our generation. Uh, it is not so immediate, but it is also true that always when there are like social mobilizations, for example, in uh, May 2000, when there was like the one of the uh, Gaza uh, bombings by, by, by the IDF, um, it was very, it was incredible how in all over Italy, younger generations took to the streets against war and for the Palestinian people. Younger generations you never saw before in the streets. So like there is a way, there is also like a, a duty for us, there is a task for us, for socialists to, to capture these moments, to transmit also the importance of socialist, of international topics to, yeah, if they take to the streets for peace or against bombs, I mean, it's very important, but it's not enough. We know we need to like, uh, yeah, translate it also in positive uh, 
uh, demands, so like social justice, uh, uh, ecological justice, and so on and so on. And I think this is um, the international topics can be important for that. We made also, for example, what you saw uh, said about the Cuban doctors. We had a campaign also like orientating ourselves on the on the. Uh, Cuban experiment and the Cuban capability to develop five different vaccines, we used this moment also to bring into the debate of, uh, of the crisis we were living with the COVID, with the like uh, incredible expenditures for the vaccines, for Moderna, Pfizer and so on, to, to show there is another way to organize uh, uh, crisis. There is another way to respond to crisis and the Cuban uh, uh, experiments and the Cuban ex um, example was, was very important then. But it is also true that like the memory is very short. So the, the Italians, they knew, okay, the Cuban are coming, like the, the, the group of uh, 70 doctors coming to Italy because the Italian healthcare system was so destroyed that they couldn't afford to like uh, give an answer to the crisis but it is also true that when like the the deepest crisis was over like we do not remember anymore that the cubans so it is also a task for us to bring to continuing always i mean this is the to make politics from a position of like uh, yeah of a, of a weaker it's always like that we have to repeat the things thousand times the bourgeoisie can say it once and then it's like in the head. Racism, it's going in the head very quickly. But we have to fight uh, strongly and, uh, and uh, repeatedly for that. But I think, and yeah, internationalism was and will always be like a, a, a pillar for the building of a, of a working class. Well, I got the different question, uh, the difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll try. Um, why left is so weak in Italy? Why it became so weak? It's, it's a question we always uh, do um, meetings with people and comrades um, uh, from Spain, France. Uh, you know, it, it's the country, the more similar country to Italy in Europe. And uh, it's very difficult to explain because everybody, you know, reminds about uh, Italy where we had Red Brigade and uh, Army Struggle. And still, until the 90s, I was, uh, you know, I became a communist when I was 13 because in my school, my school uh, was occupied because of a reform of the system of schools. And uh, I was participating in, and it was all the leaders were communists, but not of some party. Uh, it was really in the social movements, the presence of uh, communists, like in the 70s, the 90s was like, you know, a reprise of 70s. And until G8 in Genova, I don't know if you remember the big demonstration after Seattle, that movement, the new global or no global movement in Italy. Uh, we, we were very, very strong in Italy, the social movements. Then uh, it started a decline. Uh, I would say there is um, at least two different um, answers to that question. The, the first is a social, uh, I mean, uh, response. Um, Italy uh, has lived a decline since uh, 20 years. And uh, the graph the Maurizio shows about uh, the crisis in Italy. It, 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 if we have, we had a comparative one with the United States, you have the same uh, crisis in 2008. But then the United States start to run again, 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 and grow. Uh, and then with pandemic, you got another one. So after 2008 until uh, 2020, you had 12 years of growing um, economy. And in Italy, no. <laughs> you got two big crises, uh, 2011, that really stops everything. And now you have to start again. That put all the society in a condition of frustration, resignation, depression, and... and um, you know, the, the metaphor of this is really the sex, okay? Sex in Italy, uh, everything, everybody thinks about sex in Italy, Italian lovers, Italians do it better. And uh, last year there was a uh, research, oh, sex is really important, I mean... 
Yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's the idea you have like uh, Latin male male are always you know ready to have sex, but um, an important center of research in Italy last year made a very good research about sex in Italy, and uh, it confirmed what we knew, uh, you know, with some research made by talking with people, that uh, really people are starting to have difficult to have sex in, in the sense that they are looking for stable partnership. It's like in, in a crisis, it's like you are on a ship in a storm and you try to grab everything you can get. And people start becoming very anxious about situation you live in society and politics. So you turn uh, it's typical of Italian tradition, you know, you turn uh, toward your family, your stable uh, partnership. And that's the reason why we have an increasing of violence uh, between women in family, you know, and even male, which is strange, you know, women that <laughs> beat male in families, because uh, this kind of relation, it's more and more, you know, pathologic, I mean. And young people, it's feeling all of this because uh, Italy, it's really a country for all men because it's all people that votes. So the politics, it's not interesting in developing young people. So the young people, uh, you know, think about politics. It's a news fool. Um, this society has nothing to me. I have to emigrate or I have to think about my own business. And, uh, you know, Salvador Allende said that to be young and not to be revolutionary is a contradiction in biology biological terms. And that's why in, in Italy we have a contradiction in biological terms. So you have even young people that don't want to go out and meet other people to have sex because they prefer to stay always with the same partner, even if they are 18 or 20. It's a condition of they, they don't want to risk and because there is too much, uh, already too much, uh, you know, uh, pressure from the rest of society. So this psychological and social condition brings that you have difficult to recruit people in doing something different. That's the social reason. Uh, everybody wants to uh, save uh, himself. There is no uh, collective uh, idea of saving, uh, you know, altogether, which is very strong in Italy until the 90s. Um, and then second reason, it's political. You know, if uh, a lifetime, it's a short period of time. We uh, live very uh, short period of time in relation to political process. But in, in, in life, for instance, of my father, he saw the Communist Party growing after the Second World War. He was very poor. He was a son of a worker. He, uh, his family really earned nothing. They cannot eat. And in the same time, you know, this so Communist Party struggles, a lot of uh, wealth redistributed and of course, working and studying. And my father could have uh, a kind of stability. And in the same life, he saw uh, his son, <laughs> like me, <laughs> you know, having more and more precarious job, precarious, and arriving at the age of 40, uh, still precarious, and it's a normal condition in Italy. So uh, at the same time, the same people who were filling all the newspaper with, create uh, words about communists and so on. Now they are at the government doing the worst thing. So how can react someone? He don't believe in, in anything at all. Uh, the fascists is different because, you know, the fascists, they always say they, they, they was, were living like rats because they cannot talk about politics in Italy until 70s. Then the CIA, you know, uses... Uh, a lot of fascists for um, uh, attack, terrorist attack in Italy. You know, they put bombs on train and so on. Uh, and, and 
now, the, since Berlusconi took the power, they are starting talk, talk again. And in fact, what they did, it's what really happened. So in that part of population, it's not that the people be, uh, have become unfascist. It's, it's, it's always stable. I mean, the, the, the score of votes they took, it's just that they are more proud of be fascist now. It's like you cannot, you cannot say something. Now you could say it's the same thing, I think, uh, we see with Trump in United States. I mean, it's uh, uh, racism in America. It's still always present, you know, but sometimes undercover. Now with Trump, okay, it's normal to see. And, and, and it's the same thing with fascists in Italy. Um, about coalitions, I totally agree. I, I mean, we are trying to do this coalition now because we have a democratic emergency. That will be the first time in an Italian elections that you risk to do, do not have anything from a left party because the thing the more leftist thing is democratic party that um the commentary of democratic party about the less uh, speaking of biden about minimum wage uh, democratic party the italian version said no it's too radical biden <laughs> i mean <laughs> biden it's too much radical for a democratic italian party so it's a really a democratic uh, emergency we are trying to put people together just to say we have the right to represent ourselves because nobody will do if we don't do. But uh, I think we have to stop thinking that erect electoral campaign and uh, the politics, it's all about election. That's an idea that's in Italy, uh, you know, the old uh, man from the left uh, uh, has got a lot. Uh, I mean, electoral, of course, it's important, but political representation, it's, uh, you know, can, can be if there is something that moves in the society. If everything is stable, uh, it's, it's really difficult to represent something that don't ask to be represented. That's the point. So we are trying to use election just to uh, say, hello, we are here. Uh, we are fighting for your rights. Uh, to uh, not fighting for entering the parliament. We are fighting to talk about this struggle and put it in television. And so you are happy because your struggle is never in the newspaper. But then after, which is the most in interesting for us, is building community. Because, and that's the last thing I want to say, in Italy, the problem during the 70s is that you had really big communities, trade unions, communities, church communities. You have a community in the society. If you go to a bar, you can, and, and still you can pass a night talking with people that you don't know because there is a sense of community. Um, and, and the problem was uh, we have to give a direction to this community in a socialist, in a reformist way, in a revolutionary way, in a conservative way, but just do uh, have a community. Now the problem is that the community, <laughs> it's over. And so if we want to have some result on the electoral level, we have to build community again. So we are trying to do in Italy is that open these uh, people's houses, we call it people houses, the, the, the place where people self organized to respond to their needs. For instance, during pandemic, Italian states was completely absent. They, we were the first country to enter in lockdown, but lockdown and stop. I mean, if you don't have money because you are an irregular worker, so you don't have any money, uh, you don't have any food, you don't have any masks. And so what we did is to organize in all part of Italy some kind of team a squad to rescue people and uh, bringing them food, masks, and and even uh, you know medical care and some doctors to make visit them because the state was completely um, out of order. You know? And so, well, to come back to coalition, it, that's the point. I don't believe that this coalition will change uh, the situ the electoral situation in Italy. We have some 
opportunity to score the 3% and enter in the parliament. But actually, it's very difficult to say because the uh, electoral campaign doesn't start yet. We are still collecting signatures and the public opinion is very fluctuating. And so it's impossible to say now. The, in fact, it's impossible to have um, pools about the situation in Italy. Uh, but even if it doesn't happen, well, if we will enter in the parliament, I hope we will see you next summer here and <laughs> with our parliamentaries and we will tell another story because that could be really a great victory. We don't have communists in the parliament since 2008, so it's a lot of time. But uh, even if it doesn't happen, I think we have to work on social coalition, uh, on construction of communities. And that's the reason why for the end of, of, of October, so one month uh, after general election, we are still, we are already working on um, a general strike with a lot of association and trade unions. And that's the coalition that uh, in, in interests us the most because it's a social co coalition to build a community. And then I think on this basis, you could uh, build the political representation. I don't know if I, it was a good response. Thank you. Thank you so much for those responses. I think we can see if there are any last questions. Um, chat. Oh, Derek. I'll say um, the chat has one question, which is, um, how do you see the role of integrating immigrants in the struggle for justice and to prevent migration being used by the right as a political point? Um, and then Derek has another question. Mine is related. It's about, you know, I mean, Italy is a very recent nation state, and so, how does you know the national divisions or the racial divisions or how, you know ethnic divisions? How, how are you overcoming those in the in the struggle? And I also have a question, which is just more. Um, I'm curious to hear about you know we've been talking a lot about the struggle about how um, the communist movement is quite marginalized. So I'm curious to hear stories of the wins that you've had in your community, um, to see the kind of successes, to hear what has been effective or um, what I'm looking for effective, successful, but also whatever that looks like to you. Um, I'm just curious about what kinds of steps have been moving you guys forward. That's all. Okay, I will spend a couple of words about the question on migration. I think it's uh, fundamental and we are also like working on that. Uh, like in, in Naples where we are active in our social center, we have a huge uh, migrants community uh, being with us in the sense that we uh, like every social activity and I think this is also linked to the wins and to the victories we had in as a community. Um, uh, we organized like uh, we tried to organize like the social needs of the people, but not we for them, but with the people, of course. And this was also the question with the migrants. From one day to the other, they came to our place and they said they had problems in their uh, uh, asylum asylum centers where they were like uh, hosted, and um, and they started to organize. And so we organized with them and we uh, build up mobilizations. Uh, um, what we call also popular control of uh, the places where they were living to identify the problems where the state is not giving the answer or not providing the services they need the, the state has to and like that we we build up like social mobilizations with migrants and out of that uh, we identified also like a general problem uh, that uh, migrants and refugees above all were living in Italy and above all in the in southern part of Italy it's like the question of the documents so like uh, with the undocumented migrants, then we started to have like a legal assistance because this was also like the state has to provide legal assistance for the refugees, but they uh, give that to privates. And the privates, they just take the money and they do not give to provide the, the legal assistance. So we intervene in this gap that the, the state is producing and uh, by having legal assistance and using also the legal assistance, of course, for uh, creating new mobilizations. And, uh, and this was very important, it's still very important. We have like uh, a, a, a migrants movement in Naples, migrants and refugees movement in Naples that counts officially like 4,000 people because there were like 4,000 immigrants passing through our uh, social uh, center for uh, asking for help and, and participating also in mobilizations. 
And uh, what is also interesting that if you organize this kind of uh, of, war, of of intervention in a social center that offers also other uh, services, um, you can really take all the problems that re uh, refugees and migrants are living. So if there is a problem of documents, okay, you have legal assistance, but there is also a problem of language, for example. So we have like langu language courses organized, Italian language courses that gives the possibility that it's a tool also to be stronger for the migrants in the labor market or in the confrontation with the boss who does not want to pay the salary as he as he does uh, as he must and so on so there was like there were other like other services and uh, uh, ways to 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 sustain migrants and i think this is uh, fundamental to to have like structures like what we call mutual aid structures that are not just mutual aid because we are like a good people, but also like a way to organize. And this is like what we are doing uh, in Naples, in our in our people's house. That's what we are trying to do in all over Italy. The question of how to um, like take away the question of migration from the far right, that's a very complex question because I think that it's, it's, it is a high risk to try to beat the far right and the right on the on the base they are using to create a consensus because we are like weak because the general uh, feeling in the society is like ah immigrants are taking away our jobs ah immigrants are costing too much we have to send them away they are coming here because they have like economic problems and not war or poverty or uh, no it's poverty and not war so they have not the right that's that was also the reason why the uh, white uh, uh, refugees from Ukraine were welcomed like uh, it was incredible in Europe. I think in the United States maybe also, but in Europe it was really incredible to see the big difference uh, between uh, people coming from the African continent and so on and, and the Ukrainian refugees. But I think we have to give an answer like we have to return like on the social on the social question of uh, of, uh, of the far right. I w a short example, the uh, Giorgia Maloney, Brothers of Italy, the maybe future uh, uh, prime minister of Italy. She was saying very clearly, she's like a woman, she's Christian, she's white, uh, she's against refugees, she's, she's against uh, civil rights, against homosexual rights and so on. And, um, and this is like what characterize, characterizes her strongly, like these identitarian questions. But she said in the same in the same interview, she said that she will follow the economic and financial politics of the big bosses of the Industrial Confederation of of, uh, of Italy. So she will uh, cut taxes for the companies. She will not introduce a minimum wage for the workers. She will abolish uh, the what we call the uh, um, the basic income, so like the um, social assistance and financial assistance for the poor. So if she's saying she's making politics for the white working class, you have to catch her on that. She's not making politics for the white uh, Italian working class because she has like a class perspective. So she's making politics for the rich and not for the working class in general, either black or white. So we have to, I think we have to focus there. So we have really to, I mean, I do not care what she's thinking about about us, but I care what the uh, people voting for her are, uh, is, are thinking. So we have to speak to the people in this way. You are really thinking that she's making the interests of, uh, of the white working class and show how this is not the point. This is not the, 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 the reality. How the program is a capitalist uh, bourgeois program of, uh, of, uh, of the far right. And in this way, you can also, I mean, it's complicated because we have really, the confrontation is hard with people thinking uh, they are like different because they are white. So uh, talking about them, about like the, 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 the social rights of immigrants, you will, yeah, it's really complicated. So we have to like switch over on the other topics and like this, like take away the people from the far right and uh, organize them. Because when they come in our place, for example, also like, People um, not very sensitive on the racial question in Italy. They came in our place because they had a problem because they have they need food, so they come and we have like the fruit distribution. And they saw that the people also asking for food or also asking for medical care inside of our uh, of our social space are also immigrants. So they they connect, they recognize themselves 
socially in the moment when they take the food, when they take the, the social assistance and so on. So it's like this is the moment where you can create like unity also, class unity. And uh, and not by arguing with no, but migrants have to, to have their rights. Of course they have to have their rights. They have to have the same rights. But we, we fight for that, obviously. But in a, in on the on the level of argument of political arguments, we have to yeah to switch a little bit. I think. Well, I think uh, usually uh, the left underestimate the role of um, um, happiness in politics for people. I mean, uh, the problem is that um, racist people and their leaders they make you happy because uh, we um, there's a part of left the democratic left always saying like we have to fight fascism and we want to demonstrate that the immigrants that arrive in Italy well maybe they don't stay so much because they go to France so it's not true that we have an invasion on immigrants in Italy of course it, it's true there's no invasion and immigrants really wants to go to France because Italy, <laughs> it's not good for Italian people. <laughs> you can imagine for immigrants people. But uh, that's not this the point. I mean, uh, the idea, the, the, the right understood something that we, uh, the, the, the left, the communists understood one uh, the last century um, in fact they understood that if you are poor if you are living a hard life and if you are you know your, your life every day it's a, it's a, it's a fight against someone you need someone that recognizes you recognize your problem and say okay you are a shit, but there is someone who is more shit than you. So probably you're not the worst part of the society. And, and that's enough. Because happiness for human beings is not like I'm happy of where I got. Because if, if not, everybody should be happy because we have two arms and two... No, and it's not obvious. We couldn't be uh, born with a lot of problems. And so we are not never happy of what we got. We are happy if there is someone who has got less than us and we feel, you know, better than him. And, and far right really understood this point and always make this confrontation and gives not a... Um, truly uh, response, social response, economic response, but an ideological and a moral response, which is still important. And when communists, uh, you know, we had a lot of workers in Italy uh, during the 50s and the 60s, we were poor, but they were proud. You know, you had really, they were proud to be workers because they were the people that product the wellness of all the countries and the people that when they made the struggle, they put the line of rights up for everyone. And, and, and that was a point. They, maybe a worker now, he, he, he lives better than his father because he's got a, a, an heritage of uh, the house, maybe he's got a car, uh, he's got a lot of things that his father, worker, he, he didn't have. But his father had the proud of be part of something. And that's the point we racist. I mean, they make you feel part of something. And so we have to create uh, something, uh, the sense of be part of something. Uh, and then uh, uh, th there's a second point, more concrete. Uh, in the north of Italy, in the last 10 years, we had a lot of struggle on Amazon and all the system of logistic, logistics. Uh, and they were all immigrants, people who worked in logistics, and they worked for 600, 700 euros per month, which is a very low salary in Italy. The average wage is about 1,200. So uh, it was the less of a normal wage. That's the reason why all the immigrants did it and not the Italians, uh, because the Italians didn't accept that work. 
they started to struggle with a base, uh, a trade union base, which at the beginning was very, very little, uh, something like 50 people in all Italy. They started to do the struggle. They start to uh, win, 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 win. When we were in Naples, you know, just um, supporting this struggle, in Naples, all the workers were Neapolitans because the Neapolitans are the black people of Italy. <laughs> and... You know, that kind of people, we really knew them, we loved them, but very ignorant people, uh, people who are, you know, in, a, in territories where Camorra, the Neapolitan mafia, uh, rules. So they are, you know, uh, like um, not so against this kind of system. But when they knew about the struggle in the north of Italy and they knew that in the north of Italy, immigrants people uh, can take better contracts, better wages, they uh, turned up mm, toward us because we were there, we were telling the story, we were showing the contracts uh, and they uh, said like, uh, immigrants are people, are very brave people, we should be like them. So you can understand if you see something that is working, uh, you <laughs> you want to participate in it. So that's that's a really important point. And then uh, to answer to your questions, uh, your question, and I stop uh, and to uh, say what I wanted to say before about our lifetime. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't know next year what we will see, but uh, I can tell you that when we started with this project, it was 2008 and we were uh, surviving uh, after a lot of defeat. The, the most important is that in uh, Genova during the G8, you know, people shoot on us. We had a comrade of us who was killed, and that was a really big issue. When you uh, arrive at a certain point of force, of social force, and the police shoot on you, and uh, for three days you have to uh, fight against the police, and run away, and you see people uh, very, you know, injured, and then everything stops, and people start to enter in your room and beat you and torture you, because that is what happened after G8 in 2001. So uh, for, uh, and then uh, we still resist. And then 2003, Italy was the most important country to mobilize against the war in Iraq because uh, Bush and Berlusconi uh, brought Italy too in war in Iraq. And we had Italian soldiers dying in Iraq with no reason because Italian people were were completely against the war. And we put two million people in the streets of Rome. And then we weren't able to change the situation. No? So you have to ask you some questions. You have to reflect and you have to come back. And in 2008, when we saw that crisis, we, we see that there was a possibility, but we were 14 people in a room, 14 people with no money, with no contact. <laughs> with, uh, that was a difficult situation. Now, uh, when we started with Power to the People, now we are more than 5,000 and we got 30 uh, people's houses in all Italy. We are very well recognized. We are uh, a friend of us who is going in television every week to defend our, um, you know, project and programs. Uh, and so, yeah, it took 14 years in my life. It's a long time. But if you think about a life of someone, you know, a life of political organization, it's not so much. And I think the more difficult is to pass from invisibility to visibility. <laughs> when you do something like this in a period of crisis, you could increase very quickly. So uh, what we are trying to do now is to exit, to escape from this condemnation to invisibility and to conquer the right to be, um, you know, listened by our people. Because when we have this occasion in people's houses and we talk with proletarians, the majority stands with us. It's, it's ready to defend us. Uh, we've been uh, denunciated and arrested for some demonstrations in Italy and we had proletarian people out of the tribunals to demonstrate with us, but because they had possibility to know us. 
The problem is that proletarian masses don't have the possibility to listen to something different. So we have to fight for the visibility that could be the condition to make socialism even in Italy, in the US, and everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, comrades. Uh, we look forward to following the struggles of power to the people and of the broader working class in Italy. Um, and thank you so much for being here, for traveling all the way from Naples, sharing, exchanging with uh, the rest of the comrades here.